Hey guys, I'm Dov, and today I'm back with part two of my replay marathon. We're going to be going through another five today, and this is the moment you have all been waiting for. I think I might be the only one to have actually tried this thing, but we've got the Mortar Wagon here in a multiplayer match against the Green Skins. Black Iron Battles leading the way for the old skins there, so let's get to it. I am under the banner of the Golden Order. We've got Balthazar. A uh, mortar wagon and a steam tank, so plenty of mobile artillery. We've also got two war wagons to do some skirmishing. Very skirmish heavy front line with some free company militia, including the Regiment of Renown. Just two spearmen, a couple of Empire Knights, and of course, some pistoliers. For Black Iron's force, he's got some goblin archers currently getting shelled by the mortars. We've got some black orcs, two black orcs, a Ragnarok spider, uh, a couple of goblin big bosses on spiders, Wurzag on foot, three. Goblin uh, Doom Diver Catapults, which is pretty deep, and three goblins to protect them. So, very interesting. It's going to be uh, quite the artillery duel today um, with the Mortar and the, uh, the Doom Divers. Obviously, I don't want the Mortar to be in range of the Doom Divers themselves, but right now we're doing a great job just uh, shelling these Goblin Archers. And in particular, the Rusty Airs, if we can maintain visibility on them, obviously, are going to be the I ideal target. But even just... Exploding these regular goblin archers will be reasonably effective. We're gonna move up the war wagons to start to do some skirmishing. Meanwhile, over here, overcast plague of rust on the Arachnorok to bring it down to quote unquote only 90 armor and gonna take quite a bit of damage from those pistoliers there, but still a nice wild tide in the back, sort of disrupting those Empire Knights. Doesn't do a ton of damage. You can see the uh, war wagons, they haven't done a ton of damage, but they haven't taken a ton of damage either, just kind of disrupting this little skirmish. And we have managed to pull these black orcs into a bit of a kill zone here, so obviously the base free company don't have good AP values, but uh, the Sterling's Revenge definitely will do well here. Beautiful overlapping lines of fire as the uh, War Wagons themselves provide a bit of overwatch. We've got the Empire Knights moving up, so definitely a very rough situation uh, for these Black Orcs. We've got uh, Empire Knights charging through to get into the back line here, and over here, what had been a good situation, FG to get was able to catch some of those Pistoliers and route one of the units off. But uh, Wurzag now going to get a little bit caught out of position. The terrified Pistoliers came back. And now with Wa being popped, Fists of Gork active. You know, Wurzag's just full-blown Orc charging. Not realizing that he's going to get kited and shot to oblivion by two Pistoliers. Because he only has 30 armor to begin with. So yeah, a little bit rough there. A <laughs> big mistake by Black Iron. <clears throat> going to lose out his leadership there. But uh, Spider's still perfectly healthy. We've got the two big bosses as well moving in here. Unfortunately, the Black Orcs running into that uh, that kill zone wasn't working out great. But the Doom Divers have just been doing relentless damage here. You can see all my Free Company Militia have pretty much been routed off at this point. All getting very, very low. Not a lot of tools left to deal with the Spiders. So here comes the Steam Tank. <clears throat> Not an ideal situation by any means. It's, the spider has anti-large armor piercing and will actually do really good damage to the steam tank, but figured it was better that we just kind of hold here for a while, try and get some spearmen in for support, uh, and, you know, get some of these other units here. We've got, like, the war wagons providing some armor piercing missile damage. So you can see the little outriders in the back there with their nice uh, mustard-colored outfits getting some beautiful shots into that, uh, that big old queen there. And, oh, man, these guys got it right. All these guys have helmets. That's... These guys know what's up. All of them are probably going to survive. Anyway, you can see the uh, leadership damage. Again, because of the loss of Warzag is pretty severe on the Arachnorok Spider. It is wavering at this point. Unfortunately, the big bosses have gotten back and are disrupting the uh, the War Wagon circle here, which is not the best. Uh, the mortars, yeah, getting a little aggressive. We're using it kind of like a chariot to disrupt these goblins. Just push through them and then roll to the other side, uh, which is the advantage, of course, of the war carts. The mortar has taken quite an advantage from the big bosses. These other two, though, again, just kind of uh, sitting here in this little circle. As the big boss attacks the one, the others can shoot him from the side. <laughs> and this guy, surrounded by all three of these chariots, just getting kicked in the face by horses. Very uncomfortable situation. And although he won't take a ton of missile damage there, again, every little bit counts. And here comes a steam tank for a nice terror causing rear charge on those gobbos. The other, the big bosses, I probably won't get terrified, but we'll see. The spider is getting very low at this point, and the mortar is in a secure position and firing once again. Empire Knights crusading in the back line, starting to get pretty low on HP, taking a lot of Overwatch fire, but we have been able to disrupt this formation. That being said, two Doom Divers are still online. This third crew is also back, ready to remount their piece, so still some Doom Divers left to deal with. Balance of Power is shifting in my favor, though, as Balthazar comes down, the Steam Tank gets involved, and we are able to route off these two goblin big bosses with the uh, <laughs> the bumper cars here. So yeah, war carts actually I think might be pretty decent in this matchup. 
potentially. Uh, this is one matchup where I do think they could be pretty useful in just sort of disrupting Greenskin Infantry. They're going to be really good against light Greenskin Infantry as chariots, and because you have just such a decisive cavalry advantage with the Empire, uh, you're relatively safe to bring the War Wagons. And of course, supporting with a steam tank like this, just going with the heavy chariot build, against the Greenskins, I think it's going to be pretty tough for them to deal with, honestly. They don't really have the best tools for it, and, like, the Spider is definitely one tool, but you saw here how I didn't even have that great of anti-large armor piercing tools, but we're still able to deal with the Spider effectively enough. You can see it's, it's on the field still, very low on HP, though, and, of course, the single target damage from the Steam Tank will be very, very effective there, and looks like I actually shattered the big boys, so, yep. Pretty good stuff. At this point, the War Wagon's gonna roll forward, start to roll over the goblins, sort of act as late game chariots here. And oh man, just ping ponging those goblins between the two carts. That's absolute brutality. You know they, they planned that out, right? <laughs> oh man. That's why I call them bumper cars, right? But the, uh, yeah, the War Wagon's the missile damage honestly isn't amazing, but just the disruption of having the chariots, and they are pretty durable chariots, even if they're not very fast. Personally, I would like to see the I, the basic war wagons. I mean, they're useful. They're not amazing. I think the ones these this variant the, with the dudes in the back honestly should be um, a little bit faster. Maybe 55 to 60 speed versus the 50 for the artillery pieces. Because you know it makes sense. It's just some dudes. They're not quite as heavy as a giant slab of metal, right? Um, and also, I think they should maybe do a tiny bit more missile damage as well. But still. Played out pretty well here, and if we go ahead and take a look at the end screen, uh, yeah, you can see just nice kills spread all around, 91 kills on the Mortar Wagon. I do think that this matchup potentially is a decent one. Um, you could also see it against the Wood Elves as well, if you go with a very mobile force, and, you know, just try and screen out from Way Watchers, and then use that thing to bomb them um, from, a, from a long distance. You know, it has the speed to reposition if you need to get away, so... I could potentially see this working out against the Wood Elves as well, here against the Greenskins also. Um, I, I don't think against Beastmen or Norska that you're going to be able to protect it, but maybe against Dark Elves as well. Pretty much anyone that has high high value low armor targets, or just in general a lot of low armor targets, um, and you're not going to face too significant of counterfire or cavalry advantage. Just a lot of caveats, but those are the matchups where the War Wagon can be good in. So that pretty much says just the Greenskins. Uh, maybe Warriors of Chaos, although that's a little bit risky if they go with a very mobile build. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure. Like I said, maybe Wood Elves, uh, potentially. But I think it's honestly going to be a bit tough to make work. The Hellblaster definitely will be a lot more useful in general. But uh, the basic War Wagon, like I said, could use a little bit of buffs, but it's pretty decent. Empire Knights, obviously, still super solid. Gelt himself and the Pistoliers doing some great work. Uh, for Black Ironside, Doom Divers were super nasty this game. Got a ton of kills. And the uh, the Ragnarok Spider, despite taking a lot of damage, was able to do quite a bit of damage as well. Rack up some XP Chevrons. Obviously, just getting Wurzag killed there was a pretty big mistake. If he had just played a little bit more defensively with the Doom Divers, I would have had a pretty tough time kind of cracking this formation. But... Uh, just sacrificing the Black Orcs and Wurzag a little bit early was a bit tough. A very Orc thing to do, Black Iron Battles. Getting into the spirit of things and definitely playing into the theme of the Greenskins, but ultimately to his demise. So, uh, big thanks to Black Iron for playing. So, uh, we're going to continue on to a few more replays, so sit tight for more. All right, and for this next one, we're going to be having HDS taking Marcus Wolfheart against... Who's that out in the distance? Is that Alithanar? So we're going to be having a bit of a bow duel today. Let's go ahead and have a look at the builds briefly. I am under the banner of Nagarith for those sweet tuxedo princes, of which we do have one. We've also got Lothurn Seaguard, three of them. Uh, three units of spearmen mixed with two white lions. We've also got two handmaidens. I am slowly becoming more and more of a fan of handmaidens these days. And, uh, yeah, uh, just kidding. We've just got one here and a high mage as well with, uh, let's see here, Apotheosis. Tempest and Fiery Convocation. So Fiery Convocation actually was buffed to where it's reasonably decent now for the Winds of Magic cost. Likewise, we've got two Reavers on uh, Hidden in the Forest here. For Elith, or sorry, for Marcus, uh, he's got himself an Amethyst Wizard, Empire Knights to the flanks, a Mortar uh, on the ground, not on the cart, a Spearman and Swordsman in the front line. And it looks like a the Hellblaster Regiment of Renown. So we do have one uh, wagon here. Going to be opening up shots in the distance, getting some good skirmishing done early. 
especially on those white lines. It's a reasonably good target, but you can see here I am targeting the handmaidens directly onto the uh, war wagons, and we're doing a little bit of damage, just kind of plinking away so far, nothing too crazy. But we do have a witch hunter here as well, hidden in the woods, so it's going to be interesting. Yeah, uh, you can see here Lithanar himself is actually going to be targeting the artillery pieces, so this kind of gives us a, a good chance to compare. I do have a unit of Shadow Walkers as well, I forgot to mention. Obviously, very important, they are going to be high value here. I'm going to try and snipe the Witch Hunter first if we can. Um, but just generally, if we compare Lithnar and Marcus Wolfhart here, Lithnar does has have significantly longer range, but he does a lot less missile damage. Obviously, they have quite different abilities, with Marcus being much more anti-large focused and uh, also having the net, whereas Lithnar, you know, he has his... Uh, his uh, missile resistance buffs, and he also has, you know, the decoy and everything, making him specifically good in a kind of counter-missile role. Uh, so I did feel like he might actually be potentially a good counter, but you saw that Fiery Convocation just did a ton of damage, and that was a non-overcast version. So that, uh, that spell definitely has gotten a really nice buff. Quite a lot more cost effective now, but you can see here in the back line, uh, the Hellblaster's been tearing apart my Lothurn Seaguard. That's fine, I mean, it's not amazing, but it's okay. Likewise, we are doing some damage in return, though, uh, continuously with the Handmaiden and the Lothurn Seaguard. Here, because of that Fiery Convocation, we're able to get a really nice break and push Marcus away. Uh, the, uh, you know, Lithnar and the Shadow Walkers all relatively safe at this point. The Mortar uh, could potentially turn to fire at them. I'm not really sure. He looks like he's been going after those Lothurn Seaguard. But uh, yeah, Reavers are going to kind of try and come up and around, maybe chase off some routing units. Not really sure there. <coughs> Excuse me, but these White Lions, a little bit caught out of position here, going to get the Royal Altar Crypt Fights and other units, you know, from multiple angles here. This is going to be a lot more than these White Lions can handle. They were relatively healthy up until then, but now getting routed off you can see the mortar shots now targeting the shadow walkers pretty good choice they are quite high value although the loose formation is a little bit rough but empire spearmen honestly shadow fighting against shadow walkers because of the anti-infantry of the shadow walkers and their good stats they will do quite well here likewise we're going to be hitting with them with apotheosis just to make sure they stay nice and healthy but oh man that mortar rain and fire there some really nice hits get some good damage in so far that being said, the rest of the Empire Army is suffering pretty badly. We've been able to catch the uh, the uh, Black Wagon here with some Illyrian Reavers, and now the Armor Piercing of the White Lines will follow up as well. The rest of the Empire Infantry getting a little low. They were able to win a nice little engagement here and beat down those White Lions who would come into the second line, but at this point I do have my Dragon Princes now who, uh, although I missed the charge, they still will be able to at least hold for some time here. Looks like they got hit by the accusation there, dropping their melee defense, armor, and everything else pretty significantly. A very nice play. Uh, the Witch Hunter's still obviously around, but you can see here that with the Lithnar and the Shadow Walkers being more or less free to fire, we're going to be able to get some good work in. Uh, Marcus has been trying to snipe out the um, High Mage to get rid of healing, and you can see he goes for another targeted shot there, but a Lithnar's bow actually is heavy enough to knock Marcus off his feet, and he has been consistent Consistently getting knocked around by Lithnar. <laughs> kind of crazy to watch these two sort of duel it out with their missiles, but he takes a shot there straight to the face and is fine. But now he's going to attempt to finish off the caster there in the distance with the kill shot. But I mean, obviously the Shadow Walkers are not really making this a true one-to-one -one fight. Uh, of course, I have healing as well, whereas, uh, you know, uh, my opponent went with Lore of Death here. So, interesting. But you can see the Empire Knights, the Royal Altar Fights, clearing up the Reavers they had been in the second line. I honestly haven't been able to get to this mortar quite yet, so I just decided to shoot it with the Lothurn Seaguard if we can. Maybe, maybe we'll switch targets to the uh, Altar of Grip fights, but yeah, uh, Marcus unfortunately, uh, in, in a straight up missile duel with Lithanar because he has significantly shorter range and sort of a different specialization, a Lithanar is a better ranged duelist, which I, we, we've never really had the opportunity. I guess, you know, you could take maybe like an Lithanar versus a Glade Lord. Um, or, you know, maybe like a, a princess versus a glade lord or something, but now the Empire has an option to sort of go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and that, that foot legendary lord bow, you know, bow user, really Marcus and Alithanar are the only two that are comparable like that, and it was a pretty interesting battle to see, you know, kind of how it would go here. Um, obviously pretty experimental builds on both sides, but definitely the Shadow Walkers helped quite a bit here. Obviously, you have to bring Nagarith to be able to get them, but yeah, oh man, friendly hit there on the, on the Handmaiden, actually, from the kill shot. It was unfortunate. Um, I guess not friendly hit. Yeah, almost a friendly hit on those Altor Crypt fights, but it did do a decent amount of damage. 
Um, anyway, yeah, I'm just so used to using Wolfheart these days that it feels like a friendly hit. <laughs> but uh, anyway, Lithnar firing here. The decoy actually has been quite useful. The decoy is currently chasing off some Spearmen, which it absolutely can do, even though it doesn't do any damage. Um, but yeah, Amethyst Wizard getting caught up. Reaver's taking out the last of the Mortar crew, and that will pretty much be game. So, uh, Lithnar taking the lead in the missile. Oh, and he finishes off Wolfheart with the last shot there. How about that? Yep. Uh, Wolfheart, definitely a very strong missile hero. Probably objectively better than a Lithnar, but a Lithnar getting some level of revenge today. Let's go ahead and go to the last replay for today. Ah, uh, you know what? I actually almost forgot about that. Uh, that army breakdown there. I just briefly wanted to mention 128 kills for the High Mage. Like I said, Fiery Convocation has been buffed. I think it has a slightly lo shorter cast time to compensate for the fact that the animation spit takes to lo so long to spin up. And, of course, the damage has been buffed as well. So, I definitely recommend whether you're taking Teclis with his bound item or whether you're taking a High Mage. Definitely consider Fiery Convocation now. It is certainly worth bringing in certain situations. I was able to use it quite well here. Of course, the Shadow Walkers and Lithnar, uh, taking out Marcus was very important, taking out the Witch Hunter as well, and the Handmaiden, honestly, um, only got 12 kills, but she was picking away at that Black Wagon the whole time and just generating some excellent, excellent value. White Lions, of course, beat down state troops, uh, will get beat by great swords, but still reasonably cost-efficient in this matchup. This is one of the few matchups where I actually do like White Lions quite a bit. And the Dragon Princess ended up being a little bit of a distraction piece, but, I mean, hey, we won at the end of the day, right? So, for realsies this time, now let's go on to the next one. Alright, we're back once again with Lizardmen, this time taking on the High Elves. This is actually King of the Dead, so a handful of the uh, top-end tournament players who are going to be playing in this weekend's uh, Warpstone Cup for Italian Spartacus, which might have started al already, honestly, but... Um, yeah, they they're, they did get early access keys so they could start practicing because obviously the tournament being this weekend is going to be using the new stuff. So King of the Dead and I getting some practice games. Uh, this is the the one of the practice games that we got. And it's going to be an interesting one. You know, High Elves versus Lizardmen is a potentially really tough matchup for the High Elves. But I've been using builds similar to this and having some success. We've got Teclis, Double Handmaidens, the Phoenix. We've got uh, three units of spears. Sorry, four units of spears, two White Lions, uh, two Archers, Everqueen's Court Guards. And uh, yeah, a couple of Reavers just for some tactical mobility. And you can see right off the bat, the Sisters are doing some really nice damage to the... Uh, the Regiment of Renown Boxigors there. So far, so good. But the Slon is a uh, very vulnerable position here. He's going to get netted, and we're going to concentrate all fire on him. Try and take him out as quickly as possible, because obviously he's a very, very powerful caster. Over here, we've got two units of Reavers matched up on one Cold One Spear Rider, which is basically cost-effective for me. And then the Spearman will match that up even better. But a really nice banishment in the back line. Going to rip apart those Everqueen's Court Guards. Um, and maybe... Mm, Will it get those archers? It does look like it's going to get those archers. And here comes the Pop Hopox cohort from the side door as well. So uh, that banishment unfortunately did a little bit of friendly fire, but that unit of archers just got instantly wrecked. So really nice value there. Meanwhile, the handmaiden supporting in the front line and the bound cut fiery convocation from Teclis here. You can see actually does really solid damage and instantly catches that skink, which is great for me. Um, just really, really couldn't have asked for better positioning there. But yeah, you can see the Slon actually gets routed by the overwhelming bow fire here. I also dropped the Flamespire Phoenix down in the back line to chase him off, and he gets straight up shattered. So with the uh, loss of leadership for the Lizardmen, obviously the magic portion of that is huge. He, does, he has a huge amount of wins of magic left, so that's going to be great for me and immediately puts me a little bit ahead on the balance of power, but we'll see. It's definitely still going to be tight. The Handmaidens are, you know, going to have to carry quite a bit here. We're going to throw a regrowth on this one, try and get her out of there so she can sit back and use her bow. We're going to try and use the bow as much as possible to pick away at these uh, Sacred Croc scores. I do think the Sacred Croc scores are honestly pretty decent in this matchup. A lot of uh, high elf units have physical resistance and the good weapon strength and everything I think is just all around super solid here, like especially against something like Dragon Princes, which can be a bit of an issue in this matchup, but over here, the Handmaiden getting caught up by Soros is not the best, because Soros have good weapon strength, and she doesn't have a lot of armor, they will be able to do a lot of damage in that situation, but yeah, so far so good. I've been missing my uh, my bombing raids, but I have been dropping some sweet action all over those red crests, and a couple more on these Soros right here, just to round things out. 
make sure they get nice and enraged, and try and chase down the rest of these units. A few rallying archers and various other units, but mostly the, the majority of my uh, balance of power advantage here is the fact that I still have three almost completely healthy heroic units, um, and the handmaidens still have quite a bit of ammunition left as well. So it is going to be a little bit of a long kite game here, despite the fact that I am so far ahead, just because I don't have a lot of burst damage at this point to try and really finish things off. But uh, Pop Pop Box Cohort doing some good damage to the Flamespire Phoenix. This Phoenix is definitely going to have to tank out some damage here because I don't want I don't want the Handmaidens taking too much damage, and I obviously don't want Teclas taking damage, right? So <clears throat> the Flamespire Phoenix, because it has the free uh, you know uh, Savior heal if need be, it it's going to be the one to uh, tank the damage here. Meanwhile, over here, this unit of Surrounded Spearmen getting some Overwatch fire from some Archers. We should be able to rally some units to to the cause there. Over here, the Popo Pox cohort running down those archers, but again, I'm just responding with the Phoenix, and if I need to, <clears throat> I'll use the Handmaidens in a pinch, especially against the Crocs, or against the uh, Popo Pox cohort here. They don't hit quite as hard as the Croxigors. <clears throat> Excuse me. And of course, with her anti-large bonus, she can get in here and get a little bit of work done, certainly. Techless, though, not really a melee combatant, but uh, over here you can see we're just continuing to kite with the Handmaiden. She's going to continue to throw shots in the middle of those Saurus, but it, honestly, the balance of power is a little bit deceptive here just because of the heroic situation. But uh, yeah, you can see the Flamespire Phoenix even starting to take some hits. Handmaiden trying to pull away there as I throw an Enfeebling Foe on the, the uh, Cohort of Waddle there, the Regiment of Renown Boxagors. Um, yeah, Handmaiden might actually just sit and fight there for a moment, but I want to try and get these two heroes secured up around with the rest of my army, because you see I've been able to gain pretty good control of this part of the battlefield. Most Lizardman units are routing off. I've got a few scattered rally units as well, so we're going to bump a net here, drop a, a net of Amantok just to make sure that I can get my Handmaiden out without any issues. Pull up and around and then start to, uh, you know, clean up some of these units on the periphery. So we'll fast forward a little bit as we <clears throat> get that done. Apologies, guys. I've been casting a ton over the last few days, so my voice is getting a little tired. But you can see I do still have quite a bit of ammo left with the Handmaidens. We're just going to clean up, you know, whatever we, we units we can out in the open here. And then, yeah, throw in, throw in one more regrowth on this Handmaiden here. And then get ready for the final engagement. And, uh, yeah, I still have a little bit of ammo left, so we're going to try and use up that as much as we can. Pretty much anything we shoot at at this point is fine. Teclas takes a little bit of damage, but I've still got all the the potion charges left, so that's just fine. Uh, Enfeebling Foe once again, and here comes one more Fiery Convocation. Oh, yeah. It's a gorgeous-looking spell. Oh, with the, f the actual Phoenix flying right next to it? That's so cool. Oh, man, that's so cool. Does quite a bit of damage. Um... Not quite enough to route off some of these units. Who knows? The cohort of, cohort of Quaddler routed off at this... Or, sorry, the Popo Pox cohort. The uh, Handmaiden pulls away there. She is at her healing cap. The other one, not so much. But, uh, yeah, just continuing to use these arrows to plink away. You can see that arrow did a good good amount of damage there. Still got a couple shots over on this side as well. So, we'll drop one more fast forward as the, uh, the shots rain in and the Handmaidens charge. So... This is it right here. If we can get a good terror route going and maybe get some of these units to enrage, you know, into an isolated position. Um, any of those things. One last shot from the Handmaiden there, and then she charges in. Maybe? That looks like she's got one more shot. This other one's completely out of ammo, though, so we'll see. Techless is going to come back to maybe throw an Enfeebling Foe, but you can see as these units get closer and closer to critical army losses, leadership gets lower and lower, and, you know, yeah, it's they're probably related, but... Cohort of Waddle get uh, Enfeebling Foe there so the Handmaidens can finish them off, and that will be it. Those Sacred Crocs Cores get terrified. The Terror Route will probably quickly spread. We'll see. Here comes Teclis, just to make sure. Come on, Teclis, give it a good charge. Come on, buddy. Nope, 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 nope. Teclis doesn't want to charge. <laughs> However, these Illyrian Reavers might, and it just might be the thing we need to do to do the trick. Unfortunately, the Flamespire Phoenix got routed, so I do need to wait for that to come back. But uh, once it does come back, this unit gets enraged into an isolated position. The other units just get straight up routed off by the Handmaidens, and that's army losses. So actually ended up being a pretty close battle there at the end of the day. Kind of uh, makes you wonder if the Slon wouldn't have been lost early on. It may have turned out a little bit differently. Um, obviously, just getting the Slon caught out there was, was a bit of a mistake for sure. But it's an interesting matchup. I do like this uh, Techless Double Handmaiden build. 
Um, you know, I've been playing around with it a little bit, and honestly, I think I like the Handmaidens better than the Nobles, even in this matchup, just because, again, in a situation like this, where I lost out the melee engagement, I can kind of re-secure, you know, just use, use the missile damage to soften up before that super final game engagement, right? Um, and just the, having the Handmaiden gives you that little bit of extra flexibility rather than being tied to only fighting in melee. Granted, they don't do quite as well, but still, again, especially with some of the new Lizardmen tools, you de sometimes don't want to be in melee as much as possible. So yeah, I think the Handmaiden's a slightly better pick here. Likewise, I'm a big fan of the Phoenix, just super mobile. The Flaming Phoenix species, great against Lizardmen infantry, and it can drop terror all over the place. On the flip side, I do think that Sacred Croc scores are really, really good in this matchup. Uh, personally, I probably would have brought... Uh, I mean, obviously, he didn't get a, a lot of value from the Salon whatsoever, just because it got sniped, but um, I would probably take Lore of Light, honestly, here. Go with a super wide skink build supported with Croc scores, and then, and then do... Um uh, Verona's Time Warp, and, uh, you know, just juice up your croc scores and everything. Of course, with the uh, new lore attribute from Lore of Light, you'll be getting immune to psychology on all your skinks and extra leadership, so you won't necessarily get terrified by the spooky uh, spooky Flamespire Phoenix, but definitely a lot of different ways you can go in this matchup. It's uh, going to be one that I'm excited to explore, at least from the Lizardmen side. High Elves, I think, will remain relatively static to what it's always been, but uh, anyway, let's go on to the next replay. All right, and we're back now with the Empire facing off against Felcon's Lizardmen. So Felcon's also one of the ones going to be in the tournament upcoming. So let's go ahead and take a look at the builds. This should look pretty familiar now to you guys who have been watching my early access content. But we've got Empire Knights, Royal Alt Orcrifites, supported by a Warrior Priest, Marcus with two units of Huntsmen, and a whole mess of state troops in the front line, a couple of Pistoliers, and of course, an Amber Wizard. For the Lizardmen of Felcon, we've got... Mazdamundi up on Slack, front line of Chameleon Skinks and Skink Skirmishers mixed. We've got uh, Red Crested Skinks on the flanks with Sacred Croc scores. Oh man, <clears throat> that Ancient Salamander just took a shot from Marcus. And uh, he's also got the Ancient Stegodon as well. More Sacred Croc scores and Red Crest out on the flanks. And I know Felcon was, uh, was saying that because these two have the same speed values, that using them in tandem is going to be quite strong. And I definitely agree. Both armor piercing, the poison from the Red Crest helps, and they can also soak hits for the, the uh, Sacred Croc score as well. But a uh, pretty good initial situation for me, <clears throat> doing a ton of damage to that uh, Ancient Salamander there. And a bit of a weird net situation. Um... With that uh, Hunter Snare there, we're going to get those Sacred Croc scores. Unfortunately, I was hoping to also get that Ancient Stegodon there, but he is going to be charging in. We do have some Spears and other things for support, but I'm not really sure what happened here. I think the... I don't know if it, like, canceled or what, but I almost immediately get another net off cooldown. Um, I don't know if there was some kind of bug there. I'd have to go back and check, but yeah, you can see I immediately use another net there, which it should still have been on cooldown, and I think I even had charges left, but anyway... Royal Altar Griffite's going to get in here, get some prayer buffs, get all juiced up, and, uh, you know, hopefully we can try and force a blob for that soul fire as well. I do have that blob buster. So far, just pouring in fire into all these large units here. There are quite a few different large units right concentrated in this pocket, so the Huntsman can kind of fire point blank here. Uh, Marcus also uncomfortably close, but, I mean, the Demis can hold at least for the time being. Uh, Shield of Faith helping to give them some extra damage resistance and everything, so... Yeah, we're going to get the Manscore Summon in the back line, and you can see the Amber Wizard also, uh, you know, going to be sort of pressuring these Skinks a little bit, dropping down for rear charge. He doesn't have the greatest armor, so he will get hurt a little bit by getting shot by the Skinks, but we can at least pressure the uh, the Salamander here with the Feral Manscore, keep it occupied, and I think the Feral Manscore will probably actually win that fight one-on-one. -on -one. But uh, you can see Sacred Box scores coming over here to try and finish off the Royal Altar Crypt fights there. Uh, Empire Knights also charging through now to get into the second line here, start running down some of these skirmish units. <clears throat> Whereas these King Skirmishers are going to come engage the Huntsman in melee, which is honestly probably a good idea. Uh, both of these monsters get relatively low, taking quite a bit of hits already, which considering their HP pool is, you know, pretty impressive. Uh, of course, the Royal Alt of Griffites have done quite a bit of damage also, and the Amber Wizard uh, getting pretty risky, you know, cycle charging in here with him as well, but I actually do get off this Manticore Summon, I believe. Yes, even though he's routing, I did get the spell off, <clears throat> so that's going to be great. I can take one more Manticore, you know, throw it down after the uh, Ancient Salamander here, but... Royal Alt of Griffites, unfortunately, just because I don't have healing, are getting quite low at this point. Um, you know, I haven't been able to really sustain them at all, but we're going to throw a Hunter's Snare in here, try and extricate them if we can, and just fire in here with uh, various ranged units. 
Yeah, Marcus himself is in a bit of trouble, though. This Stegodon is definitely not within the scope of those nets, so he's he's going to have to probably be bailed out by these Pistoliers here. But, yeah, you can see the Soul Fire there. It doesn't do a whole lot to Monstrous Infantry, but, yeah, hey, it's it makes me feel good at least, right? Um, if we kind of look at the periphery of the battle, you can see, again, Empire units able to... Empire Knights, that is, able to break free and, again, run down these Chameleon Skinks, generating some really, really nice value. I did get both the Huntsmen in a secure position as well. And with Marcus also secure, beat up, yes, but secure, with the uh, Amber Wizard helping to finish off the leadership of the Ancient Stegodon here. We have now secured this part of the battlefield relatively well, and Marcus can start to focus again on Mazdamundi. So, pretty good situation for me. Likewise, the uh, Huntsmen are going to come up in here and start to focus on Mazdamundi a little bit as well. Uh, maybe also go after these uh, Sacred Croc scores, or even the Ancient Salamander. Salamander, actually, because it has relatively low health, we should be able to take it out pretty quick, but, man, those box scores are going to be a problem. So far, if anything, the balance of power is slightly in my favor, but the Empire Knights have had to uh, extricate themselves from those Chameleon Skinks just because the box scores are a bit too much, but over here, the uh, Demigriff Knights, there's five of them left, and they have hardly any HP, but they do still charge in here, and they are still getting hits on Mazda Mundi. And uh, B uh, Banishment goes down here, a little bit of a miss as I'm pulling my Huntsman back. Um, unfortunate, but this does leave Marcus, again, free to fire from a distance, and he is just plinking away at Mazdamundi. His shots do a lot of damage, and it's just kind of, I guess, probably because people are a Lithanar, it's I, probably just used to trying to ignore him, but, I mean, he did try and goon me with the other Stegodon, but it didn't quite work out. Maybe Mazdamundi should himself go very aggressively after Marcus, but you can see there that, um, yeah... Another Hunter's Snare, gonna drop those, uh, pin those Sacred Croc scores, rather, and then the Huntsmen immediately turn around and just start to shoot them in the face. Pretty good stuff. At this point, the Balance of Power is turning pretty heavily against, uh, against Felcon as a lot of these Skink units being cleaned up. Some decent damage there from the Ancient Salamander, but the Salamander also uh, very low, and Mazdamundi gets routed off by the Bowfire of Marcus, and honestly, one more shot will finish him off. Maybe? Come on, Marcus, I see you. Oop, there it is. Yep, might have been a Pistolier, honestly, that did the, the, did the trick. Oh no, those two Royal Altar Crypt Fights, okay. Um, yeah, they're the two Royal Altar Crypt Fights with 8 HP between them. Yes, they were the ones that finished off Mazdamundi. Okay, that is acceptable. Whew, man. Well played to Felcon. Hopefully you guys enjoyed watching that one. I wasn't sure I was going to cast this one, but I decided to, because we did play it pretty late tonight, and the patch is supposedly coming tomorrow morning. We'll see. But uh, it was a pretty fun one. Honestly, ended up being pretty close. And I think um, just the Ancient Salamander is just not really worth it. I don't, I don't think it, the HP is too low. Um, if you were to trade that out with something else, I think this build's pretty solid. And Felcon and I had kind of theorycrafted some different things um, after the fact and kind of talked talk through some different things. I don't want to give away too much of his build since that's kind of, a, you know, he is going to be playing in the tournament this weekend. I don't, I don't really want to give away too much of his stuff. This, this obviously didn't work, but you know, other builds potentially might. Uh, from my side, I do think that this kind of Marcus Missile Squad build works pretty well. It gives you good battlefield control with the nets. You've got the heavy cav to deal with whatever, you know, infantry you need to. The Altor of Crypt Fights plus the Warrior Priest, again, can deal with infantry and cav now with the new the Soul Fire. Uh, the Amber Wizard is probably the riskiest pick out of all of this, but it does give you a terror-causing, you know, armor-piercing monster that's really good at rear-charging, you know, other monsters. And, of course, the Manticore Summon is quite nice. Um, yeah, I, I'm quite a big fan of this build, and I may try it in a number of other matchups, or at least similar themed builds. But this, sort of this core, I am very much a fan of. But that's enough for now. Let's move on to the final replay for today. All right, last one for today. Marcus once again going to be leading the Empire. This time, we he is facing off against my Dark Elves. So don't play the Dark Elves too much, but we're going to go ahead and give it a shot here. I've got Marathi leading the way. Three units of Shades, some Dread Spears, and the Sisters of Singing Doom. We've also got a Cold One Chariot. More expensive, but still worth it. Some Dark Riders and some Cold One Knights. For uh, uh, HDS's Empire here... For Marcus's Huntsman, <laughs> he's got some Pistoliers, a couple of War Wagons, and some additional Pistoliers out on the far side. The Death Jacks, some Spearmen, Great Swords, Flagellants mixed in the front line with a Halberdier in the back, Demogriff Knights with Halberds, and an Amber Wizard. Very good stuff. 
So yeah, Marcus is himself going to be moving up to start doing some skirmishing at Marathi. And a nice lead-in shot there. I probably could have dodged that if I was looking a little better. But yeah, the Shades, of course, being stalked immediately pop up and just do a huge amount of burst damage and immediately shatter that War Wagon. So that's a nice little pick for me early on. 950 points straight out of the gate, more or less for free. And yeah, actually one War Wagon survives. Uh, these uh, Dark Riders are going to get through, try and go after some Pistoliers here, but we may get over-isolated on this side, which is not the best, but hey, War Wagons moving into a rearward position. I'm not honestly too concerned about it. We're just going to try and push forward as much as we can. Uh, Cold One Chariots and everything going to be very good here, especially against these Great Swords, obviously. You can see in the distance there, uh, the net did get Marathi. She unfortunately did not get, or unfortunately for me, unfortunately for the Empire, did not actually get hit by Marcus during that time. Um, hasn't really taken too much damage so far. We are going to get a Manticore summon here. Marathi's going to have to be a little bit careful, but yeah, she, you can see her taking a lot of missile fire here. And she is pretty quick. I can try and kind of dodge around a little bit here, and we're going to throw the first of many Soul Stealers. Marathi, with her extra winds magic, can just get a silly amount of Soul Stealers, but yeah, she's going to be able to heal herself back up a little bit from that. Dark Riders getting fended off by the uh, Halberdiers, though in the front line the Shades are definitely making their presence felt. Uh, Great Swords have taken a lot of damage here. Cold One Knight's charging in. And yeah, Marathi just took a nasty, nasty hit there from Marcus. Uh, did quite a bit of HP damage, didn't quite break her leadership, but she's still going to stick around for the time being. Over here, these Cold One Chariots did get hit by Demogriff Knights with Halberds, not the best. And we're also getting some uh, uh, Flagellants and Spearmen breaking through as well. Um, sh shades are in a potentially bad situation, but I'm honestly not too worried about uh, the War Wagons. Although you see they do a pretty decent amount of impact damage there. I can kind of turn with these other two units to start the crossfire. The Canine Assassin will also kind of help here as well to uh, support this back line. Marathi is getting very low though. Um, Marcus is doing a great job kind of picking away at her. And the Death Jacks now counter firing the Shades. Really, really nice use for them. Um, unfortunately, the War Wagon's just starting to run out of steam pretty quickly here as a backline pressure tool. Although the Demigriff Knights now getting back as the Sisters of Singing Doom have uh, have been routed off. So yeah, honestly, very, very even so far and a huge hit on Marathi. Um, oh, and here comes the net. This may be the finishing blow. Is it going to be enough? She is very, very low. But we do pop a Soul Stealer to make sure that she gets a little bit of HP trickle. And the net actually wears off before she takes too big of a hit there. From Marcus, so uh, Marathi survives for the time being, continuing to get healed. But the balance of power not looking great for me, as you can see. The Empire is broken through on many different fronts here. Shades getting compromised. There's only really still one unit fighting, but uh, yeah, thankfully I do still have the Canine Assassin as well, and the Cold One Chariots are still kicking with three unit models. They're going to get a great rear charge here into some great swords, doing some really nice armor piercing damage, and then immediately move over to the Death Jacks. Um, just ping pong around. This is what you need to do with chariots. And one of the reasons the War Wagon has a hard time doing this compared to other chariots, as this one gets caught up in the uh, remains of that dead War Wagon, is that they, because they're not fast enough, um, they, they just have a little bit of a hard time doing that ping ponging super effectively. I mean, they kind of can. But uh, here the War Wagon's getting caught up by Dark Riders. Again, just trying to pressure the Death Jacks. We are very close to critical army losses, though, as Marathi is just about dead. And this Soul Stealer should give her a bit more HP. Thankfully, the miscast didn't do too much damage, but she was really low there. And a huge hit to the face directly brings her down to less than 300. Less than, almost less than 100 there from that melee hit. But the Soul Stealer keeping her alive for the time being. She does get routed, though, but, oh man, she just straight up killed Marcus. Just killed him. So, yeah. Um, still not looking great, though, in terms of the balance of power. At least we got rid of Marcus, so she's not in that much danger of getting sniped anymore if she'll just come back from route. But at the very least, we do still have this Cold One Chariot, this Canide Assassin, also has gotten uh, gotten a hold of the Amber Wizard here. This is a really nice situation for me as I can throw that Assassin's Trophy just to completely nerf his combat stats, and then the Canide Assassin will come in here and deal with him quite efficiently. You can see just a few hits, and the Amber Wizard is routed off. So that definitely equalized the balance of power quite a bit, taking out both of those heroic units. Likewise, the Cold One Chariot running down the Death Jacks here. There are still quite a few Flagellants, but I'm going to be able to start rallying some of these remaining Shades and other units together. So we'll see. We'll see. Definitely on the way to a comeback, but uh, it's going to be a lot of uphill battle. There are still a lot of Empire units left. 
Thankfully, I'm getting these other two shades back from route. A few tattered cold one nights remain as well, so we should be able to at least uh, co co consolidate a few forces here. But yeah, Marathi's just barely hanging on to her leadership and uh, just a hair short of 300 HP, using her to chase off the war wagons. So we're going to fast forward a little bit through this kind of mid to late game it, uh, as it does take a little bit of time to kind of kite things out. You can see I throw a soul stealer over here. Uh, no, actually, it looks like a flock of doom, but unfortunately that unit, uh, yeah, it's shattered. It did enough. Um, but yeah, the Amber Wizard came back from route in a little bit of a pickle right now though as Marathi's going to drop down and try and finish him off again finishing off this heroic unit will significantly bring the balance of power back in my favor and go a long way to harming the empire's leadership I just have to be careful Marathi is super low and if the amber wizard were to get a lucky hit on her just through RNG she could potentially route so I do need to be really careful and really on point with my cycle charging micro but we'll see I'm gonna just keep kiting with the shades over there and trying to collect the rest of my forces the K Knight assassin is uh, getting run down by pistoliers here and he's also mostly surrounded by state troops thankfully I do have some dread spears and some cold one uh, chariots riding nearby the cold one chariots probably going to be used to go chase off more routing units and unfortunately the canine assassin probably not going to hold his leadership together for too long but marathi gets back up in the air she's going to grab one more soul stealer to heal herself and that's the nice thing about marathi is she's a little bit forgiving if you don't get her killed too quickly she does have a relatively small health pool but with the five soul stealers you can she's she's pretty close to her healing cap and it's not super hard to get five soul stealers throughout a relatively long battle like this so yeah, pretty good stuff. Shade's able to route off those great swords. We're going to use these bleak, uh, bleak swords to stop up the rest of the Empire troops and fire in with the Shades. Uh, maybe. Maybe the Shades will go after these Pistoliers instead and try and get this Canine Assassin back from route. Because uh, his still has quite a bit of missile attacks left, quite a bit of ammunition. So we'll see. We're going to drop another fast forward for just a minute here as we kind of fire in at these bleak swords and flagellants. The flagellants are honestly probably the biggest threat at this point just because they will do a lot of damage to Marathi herself. But decide to dedicate all the resources at once to try and take them out and we are able to sort of overload them to where Marathi doesn't have to face them alone. But there are still halberds and spears, and so we're going to continue to kind of fight here in this late game. You can see the Cold One Chariot coming back from route, and it was in the Empire's favor up until then. But Marathi even is going to route here, which suddenly wildly swings things back towards the Empire's favor. So it's honestly anyone's game at this point still. Um, the Cold One Chariot is a bit of a problem just because it will do a lot of impact damage even if these Empire troops are braced. Uh, it may do enough shock damage just to straight up route them alone. But if Marathi goes down here, I could potentially, you know, and, and the rest of the Shades go down, I could potentially face army losses and the Chariot may just route entirely. So let's see. Marathi comes back with 118 HP left, which is just hilarious. Uh, you know, elf leadership. Uh, shades are pretty much all routed off except for this one unit. Marathi is going to drop a risky rear charge here. Uh, I'm just trying to get the melee debuffs active though to make sure the shades get as much value as possible. But Marathi against the, even these low tier spears will take a few hits. Let's see if we can route them off before Marathi gets killed. Oh, she's down to 87. Oh man. But, but she hasn't routed. And the shades are still fighting. We managed to route one unit of spears. Oh, and the other unit of Spears routes as well. <clears throat> Gonna grab one more Power of Darkness. I don't think I can get another Soul Stealer, but I definitely want to try. But uh, Marathi's gonna charge in now with these Shades again. Oh, and she's dead. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> um, I guess that evens things up a little bit. These Empire Troops are probably gonna rally, but again, the Chariot is really the thing, and... Yeah, even with Brace units with charge defense, getting the Chariot in there is still going to do enough impact damage. And more than that, you see how low the Empire unit's leadership is? This this Chariot does cause fear, right? So it's going to give an immediate you know leadership debuff anyway as soon as it gets close. And uh, you can see, yeah, that unit shatters immediately as soon as it gets close. And the impact damage will certainly be enough to finish off the last of these state troops. So... 
Yep, that'll be it. Super, super close game, honestly, down to the wire. And had Marcus connected on a few more of his shots on Marathi earlier on in the battle, he did miss a few. Um, if he had connected on those, he probably honestly could have won, but very well played to HDS. I think that was probably the closest game that we played between the two of us, but honestly, the Cold One Chariots really carried there pretty hard. Shades also did a great job. Uh, I haven't really used Shades too much, to be honest, but I think I might start using them more um, when I actually do play Dark Elves, but Cold One Chariots have long been a favorite unit of mine on the roster, and I definitely think that the plus 100 cost increase was justified, because you can see here they are an exceptionally powerful unit. 126 kills, 2 XP Chevrons, basically single-handedly killed all of the great swords, most of the infantry, the Death Jacks, you know, just did a ton of damage in general. Of course, Marathi herself, always a powerhouse as long as you don't get her too killed. She's a little bit of a micro trap, but uh, five soul sealers is pretty legit. I like the K9 Assassin too, mostly for the Assassin's Trophy. It makes Marathi dueling someone a little bit more e easier to stomach and a little bit less risky. Um, likewise, he can kind of just skirmish, you know, apply his... I think he has poison on his bow attacks. I don't remember 100%, but anyway. For HDS here, this is a matchup that, honestly, it's it's a one of the most interesting matchups in the game because both these factions can go in, in wildly different directions. I do see what uh, HDS was going for here, and it honestly almost worked. Uh, the War Wagons ended up being a little bit of a rough pick, especially the one that got shattered right out of the gates by the Shades. Maybe if he had just brought more traditional cavalry instead, like just trade these for Empire Knights, I think, and suddenly he probably would have had enough uh, resources to roll up the Shades in melee. Um, who knows, you know, definitely hindsight is 2020, but I do think that the War Wagons are maybe not the best pick in matchups where you're going to be fam facing good armor-piercing missiles, like potentially the Dark Elves. But anyway, thank you guys for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed this 5 replay cast. I've got one more of these coming to, to you very soon, so uh, hopefully you guys are prepared for more. You're not sick of me yet. Uh, if you do like this sort of content, be sure to like, subscribe, hit that bell notification, so every time I upload a new video, you'll be notified. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.